this morning on this beautiful fall day. People are kind of trickling in, and if I wait for people to trickle in, it'll be like 10 minutes from now. So I better just start, and they'll hear us sing, and they will come and join us. Our entrance rites this morning are a little bit abbreviated. The social ministry team wanted to do uh, another offering of letters this morning, so we abbreviated some things at the beginning here. Um, we're observing this as Bread for the World Sunday. So uh, when we get to that time, I'll give you some directions for, for writing some letters and encouraging our legislators to act out of Christian values that, uh, that we want to uphold. Um, the slides will guide you through the service and uh, as usual, all baptized Christians are welcome at the Lord's table. Come and receive the sacrament of us. So we will begin with our gathering song, You Servants of God, and I invite you to stand as we sing together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom, and make us desire always and only your will through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. I invite children to come forward for the children's message. I think Raylan may have a bucket for us. Is Raylan back there? Raylan's not back there. Hopefully we're not starting too quick. They're rushing in the door. I was looking for, let's see, what shall we talk about this morning? I'm not prepared for this I one. don't know. My whole morning has kind of been like this. Yes. Um, Happy Pastor Appreciation Week. Oh, boy, thank you. Pastor Appreciation Week. All right, I get a whole week? Actually, I mean day. Just, I just a day. day. Oh, okay. All right. That's, I, I mean that's fair. Uh, that's fair. I, I'm, 
fair is uh, one day is very generous. I'm good with that. I'm good. I don't have a don't, don't need a whole week. I'm going to talk about this fellow we're going to hear about in our second reading today. Uh, the readings from Hebrews. This is kind of the introduction for the grown ups too, but you can listen to. It's from the book of Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, the person who's writing is talking about how Jesus is so much better than all the priests of the temple in Jerusalem. So way back in Jesus' day, there was this really fancy worship building, and there were all these fancy priests that were there. Uh, and they were the ones that would pray to God for people. You have a question? No, okay. So the, the writer of this book is saying, don't do that. I'll hang out for you. The writer of the book is saying, Jesus is greater than all those people. Now we know that, right? Jesus is greater than all those people. Yeah. But not everyone knew that in Jesus' day. Oh, feedback. Not everyone knew that in Jesus' day. Uh, so the writer of this book talks about a priest like Melchizedek. Can you say Melchizedek? Yes, yeah, so and Pat's got to read that reading. So sorry for you, Pat. Melchizedek. Oh, sorry, we started early, and, yeah, anyway. Hi, Raylan. How are you this morning? So, Melchizedek. Let me keep going with Melchizedek. Can you say Melchizedek? You guys got it? Yeah, Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest who blessed Abraham. Now, Abraham comes way before the temple in Jerusalem, and way before Moses, Abraham... David, and way before all kinds of people. He's, he was the first one that got God's promise that through him would come salvation to the whole world. Guess who's included in the whole world? Us, right? So the, this priest Melchizedek comes to bless Abraham. And the writer of Hebrews says it's because he's like Melchizedek that Jesus is greater than all the other priests in the temple. But we already know that. You know that Jesus is the greatest of all, right? The King of kings and the Lord of lords. So, all right. Raylan, good morning. I'm sorry we started without you. You have something to share with us, don't you? Oh, wow. What's it called? A beady boo? I don't know, beady boos. It's a sheep, though, right? I see that. What, what color are those eyes? Green eyes. We have more children. All right, all kinds of people are showing up now. All right. See, I start early and it sneaks in. All right, tell me about your beanie boo. Does it have a name? What's it named? Bear? Berry. Say it again. Berry. Berry. Say it again. Berry. There we go, now you can hear it. Bury the Beanie Boo sheep. Is that right? Something like that? Do you know Beanie Boos? Who is this? Hi, baby. My mom knows the name of these. She does? Okay. Um, how long have you had Bury the Beanie Boo sheep? At the what in Iowa? At the mall. At the mall in Iowa. Okay, you rescued him from the mall. Is it a he or a she? It's a she. You rescued her from the mall. I, I, I sometimes like to be rescued from the mall, too. I do. If someone would take me home from the mall, I would be very happy about that. Hmm. Look at her sheep connections. In our first reading, the, the prophet Isaiah is talking about what we call the suffering servant. So this is not the Melchizedek story, this is a different story. The first servant, the suffering servant. Please keep your feet down. You don't want to get kicked in the nose. Um, and uh, we understand this story about the suffering servant as a story about Jesus. Jesus, who goes to the cross for us. Now, we were just talking about how Jesus is the greatest of all, right? The King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's powerful and he's able to do all kinds of things. Did he have to go to the cross? Yes. Well, kind of. He did. did he have the power to not go to the cross if he didn't want to? Yeah. Problem? Yeah. He had the power to not go to the cross if he didn't want to. So, here, let me give you an example. Do you have to go to school? 
you have to go to school? Yeah, I love school. Bailey's not in school yet, so she doesn't have to go to school. Do you have the power to not go to school? Right, because mom says, you're going to school. Sometimes my girls are like, I don't want to go to school. It's like, that's too bad, right? But Jesus had the power to not go if he didn't want to, but he chose, he chose to go to the cross for us. To forgive our sins. To forgive our sins, exactly. So like a, like a quiet, because this doesn't make any noise, does it? No, like a quiet lamb, he goes to the cross. That's what this reading is about. For Jesus, like, what is it? What's the thing? Bury the, what kind of thing is it called? Beanie, beanie Bury the beanie boo sheep. It goes quietly, quietly. So Jesus goes quietly to the cross to save us from our sins, exactly. That's the point. All right, thank you for sharing. Bury the beanie boo sheep with us. That's a mouthful. All right. Can you take the bucket for us next week? Yeah. All right. I'll get you. No. I'm going to do that. You're gone next week. Oh. You want to take another week? You got another? You got Bridget the Beady Boo Bear to bring? Am I gone? Right. Can Raylan take the bucket for next week? No. No? Okay, I'll do it then. Or it'll just be confirmation Sunday and we'll man. So, very good. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Right back to your seat. Find my spot. First reading is from one of the four passages in Isaiah that are often called servant songs. Christians are most familiar with this servant song from its connection to Good Friday liturgy. In the light of Christian faith, the servant's healing ministry and redemptive suffering are understood to be fulfilled in the life and death of Christ. The second reading continues from the book of Hebrews. Jesus is presented as the great high priest who is obedient to God's saving plan. Jesus' priesthood precedes and exceeds that of Aaron, the brother of Moses, and the temple priests, because it is of the order of the priesthood, more ancient and more holy, an order of Melchizedek. And you can say that name however you want to. The priest who in Genesis brings a blessing to Abraham, who receives God's promises by faith. Through Jesus' suffering and death, he has become the source of eternal salvation. Hear the, word. the first reading is from Isaiah. Chapter 53, beginning of verse 4. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was, a, was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined, imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of many people. They made, his, they made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him he, he will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allow him a portion 
with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore his sin, the sin of many, and made intercessions for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Let us read Psalms 91, 9 through 16 responsibly. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your habitation, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. You shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. He shall call upon me and I'll answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him home to honor. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Every high priest chosen from among the mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as those of, all of the people. And one who does not presume to take his honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek, in the days of the, his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of reverent submission. And also, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obeyed him. Having been des designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, Do you not know what you are, you do not know what you are asking? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Now, we might perhaps hope that the disciples, the ten who overheard James and John and Jesus' conversation, were angry with James and John because they recognized that James and John had stepped out of bounds and gone in a direction they shouldn't have and were asking too much of Jesus and not understanding Jesus' mission and what Jesus was about. But probably not. Probably they were angry with James and John because James and John got to ask the question first. And then the first seat at the right-hand side and the first seat at the left-hand side would be filled up because James and John asked first. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John, it says. Not because they understand that James and John have stepped out of bounds and they do not understand the mission of the Christ, but because they wish that they had asked first. That they likewise misunderstand. In the order of the narrative, in chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Mark's Gospel, we're, we're wrapping up this journey to Jerusalem, and we're nearing the end of that, that time of teaching of Jesus that begins, as I would outline the book of Mark, begins with Jesus' healing of a blind man, an unnamed blind man. The whole section ends with the healing of a blind man who is named Bartimaeus next week. But the healing of the, the blind man without a name begins this section. And it's this curious reading that I've referred to in the last couple of weeks. The healing of the man that takes two tries even from Jesus. Right? Jesus comes upon the blind man. He puts his hands on him. The man is healed and Jesus says, what do you see? And he says, well, I see people, but they look like the trees walking around. It didn't quite take the first time. So Jesus lays his hands on him again and heals him again, and his sight is regained, we're told. And then come all of these stories about the disciples. Jesus is teaching, and three times Jesus tells the disciples, that he is going to Jerusalem, there to be arrested and tried and suffer and die and rise again. Ask Peter, who do you say that I am, the Messiah? Yes, you're right. And then Peter's like, no, no, you can't go to Jerusalem. He takes Peter and James and John up to the mountaintop, glows in the daylight for them. They come right down. And these two disciples, who've seen the glory of God in Jesus, who've heard about his mission and his journey to Jerusalem, who apparently just overlooked every time he talks about rising from the dead, they want to turn Jesus into their servant, even though Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. heard me use this metaphor before. It works for me, perhaps it works for you. Jesus, James and John want to turn Jesus, the incarnation of God, into the divine vending machine. You know how vending machines work, right? Modern vending machines. You've got an array of all kinds of good things, right? You've got the chips that you're not supposed to eat. Down there you've got some fruit that's probably not sold very well. The candy bars. And you put in your money, and you press the right buttons, and down drops what you want. Too many of us, like James and John, wish that God was like that vending machine. What, which is, what do we have to put in the slot, and then if I can press the right numbers, I'll get what I want. But besides the vending machine just being impersonal, doesn't it kind of swap the order that we might become God and God might become our servants? This section in Mark's Gospel begins with this double healing because the disciples themselves 
And we who journey with the disciples through these chapters in Mark's gospel need more than a double healing. How many times does it take for it to take? That's, oh, I can't say that, the takeaway question for the day. How many times does it take for it to take that we need to hear again about God's love for us and then trust that even when the vending machine doesn't give you exactly what you want? How many times do we need to wander away and hear again about God's forgiveness? How many times do we need to know about God's love and God's lordship and not try to turn God into our servants and our vending? The disciples in this story, the disciples in the stories throughout here, are us. And notice, Jesus, Jesus does not stop his journey to Jerusalem. Jesus does not stop going to the cross. The story continues when the disciples abandon him at the cross. Because God's love does endure beyond our demands of God, beyond our pressing the buttons and pouting because we don't get what we want. Beyond our anger at those who seem to get what they don't deserve. Beyond our self-reflection that we ourselves receive more than we deserve. God is faithful. God endures. God sticks with us and stays with us as Jesus continues with his disciples. The good news is about the faithfulness of God in the midst of our blindness and our lack of faith and our lack of trust and our being confused about the order of how things work. For Jesus teaches us a different way than the world teaches us six and a half days week. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Jesus remains, endures, and continues with us and for us to the cross and to the resurrection. So, that, that wraps most of the sermon. But this morning, we're going to do another offering of letters. We did one in the spring, I believe. We're going to do an offering of letters again on this Bread for the World Sunday. I didn't get advertisement on the walls for Bread for the World Sunday. But we might say, well, we just did that. Why do we want to do that again? Well, I think the question that I posed was, how many times does it take? for it to take, that we are called to be advocates. We are called to speak up for our neighbors. We are, we are called to work for God's justice in the world in which we live today. Not that we will bring about the kingdom, that a glimpse of the kingdom might be seen by us and those around us. A glimpse, a flash, an instance. And this is the motivation of Christians who recognize the generosity of God. To speak on behalf of those who have no one to speak for them. Oh, pharmaceutical companies have plenty of people to speak for them in Congress. Oh, big business has plenty of people to speak for them in Congress. And both of those kind of things have plenty of money to spread around. Who will speak for the people that show up on the front page of the Gazette or the back pages of the Gazette or live maybe not across the street from you but just down the road or on the other side of the river? 
Here again what Jesus teaches. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. And we who would follow Jesus would seek to make real the kingdom of God. Not just for an instant on Sunday morning, perhaps for a little bit longer for those in the world. So this morning, we'll engage in an offering of letters. Following our hymn, we'll have a response of prayer. And we will offer those as a response to God's patience and endurance and commitment to us, made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
our hearts desire to be in right relationship with God and one another. Therefore, we advocate to our lawmakers to support a budget that invests in programs that, make, that move people out of hunger and poverty. Let us act with a mind and heart for justice, love, and mercy. Lord, teach us to respond with your justice, love, and mercy in our endeavors. God, source of life, give us courage to care for all creation with mercy, to treat your people with kindness, and sustain our efforts with your love so all people thrive. Lord, teach us to respond with your justice, love, and mercy in our endeavors. God, source of light, we pray for the wisdom to thoughtfully engage with our lawmakers so they might pass a budget that supports an end to hunger in our world. Lord, teach us to respond with your justice, love, and mercy in our endeavors. God, source of wisdom, ensure in each of us gathered the desire to speak with authenticity, compassion, and direct us to change structures and places that keep people hungry. Lord, teach us to respond with your justice, love, and mercy in our endeavors. God, source of abundance, we pray for those who today will not have enough food to sustain themselves, their families, their neighbors. Challenge us to live in the spirit of your abundance to sustain and provide for all. Lord, teach us to respond with your justice, love, and mercy in our endeavors. God, source of life, may our call to stewardship be a worthy testament to what is important in your heart, the care and protection of your most vulnerable people. Lord, teach us to respond with your justice, love, and mercy in our endeavors. Amen. Please be seated. You will find near the center aisle uh, blank pages and envelopes and pens. There's probably not enough pens for some rows. Um, you'll have to use the pencils that are in the front aisle. Um, if, if you find that you don't have enough in your row, kind of look to the row ahead of you if there are papers there. In an effort to kind of keep this as focused as possible, I'm really going to I'm going to go step by step and encourage you to fill things in as we go along. So what you want to do is find a hymnal to write on. I'll actually use a hymnal. And begin with the envelope itself. And if you put up the first slide, our first step is to put your return address in the upper left-hand corner. Not John Smith, because I don't know who that is, but your own. So. Probably have to warm up your pen like mine is kind of tired and cold. And I'm writing too so that I have a sense of how long this takes. So I write slowly. All right, so return address. Most everyone should almost be done with that. Next, oh, it covered up. That says Representative Ryan. So in the center, all you're going to write is Representative Ryan or Representative Pocan or Senator Johnson or Senator Baldwin because we're going to make it easy for you. We're going to put a mailing label right there over the top of those, but we need to know who to send it to. Okay, so all you're going to do is in the center write Representative Ryan, R-Y-A-N, or Ocan Johnson or Baldwin there. That way we can just stick one on there because writing their address takes longer than writing your own address. So if you've done that, just set your envelope aside. That's it. That's all we need to do for the envelope. And then get out your white or your yellow page for, for the body of the letter. So this is actually the top of the body of the letter, right? You're going to put the date. It's 10, 21, 18 in the upper right-hand corner. You're going to write, Dear Representative Ryan or Representative Pocan or Senator Johnson or Senator Baldwin, whoever you like, right? Because that's how you start a letter. Dear Representative Ryan, comma. All right, so we're almost done. Look at that. It's easy. Okay, this is the part that, that takes longer, though. 
this is the body of the letter. And these are the things that uh, Bread for the World kind of lifts up to our attention. The intention of, of the Congress is to pass a fiscal budget by December 7. But of course, everything's on hold because there's an election, right? So everything's kind of stopped. So we get a chance to actually tell them, uh, we really want a budget that, that does some things, like maintain some programs that keep hungry school children fed, uh, that help mothers with children uh, feed their children. Programs like WIC, uh, summer meal programs, uh, SNAP, uh, tax credit for low-income workers, funding for global nutrition. So the bullet points list out some of the programs. But the, the ask is in that top line. So let me, let me pause here. Because I don't know what political persuasion you are. I don't, I don't know. That, that doesn't matter. Um, whatever you write here, I'm going to encourage you to write even if you don't like any of this stuff. It's like, I would never write my congressman about any of that stuff. Then just write and say, thanks for being a nice congressman. And fold it up and put it in there. We'll send it. We're not going to look at what you write. I'm not going to look. It's going to come to my desk. I'm going to stick mailing labels and, and stamps on them tomorrow. And they're going to go in the mail. Um, if nothing else, this is an exercise in, in communicating with the people that are elected for you. Okay. But if you want to advocate, here are the things we want to do. As Congress works to finalize the fiscal year budget 2019 um, and spending bills by December 7, I ask you, whoever you're writing to, I ask you to invest in and protect key programs that reduce hunger and poverty. Programs like WIC, SNAP, uh, tax credits for low-income workers. You can, add, you can put some specific things in there, but that top line is kind of the ask. As we're working on budgets, I believe the, the farm bill is still hanging out there too because they put everything on hold before the elections. The bottom line, my faith calls me to urge you to make public investments that will move us toward the end of hunger. You know, talk about your own faith and what difference that makes. The very bottom line in the italics, if you can witness to the effects of food programs for yourself, your family, your friends, or students you know, Right? Do you know someone that's been impacted by these programs? The kids next door? The, the children that, that you used to meet at Wilson? Or at Adams? Or at Roosevelt? Um, if you can personalize your message by reflecting on that, it'll have a greater impact. So, body of letter. And I have to write two. You have given us a world of abundance, and we confess that we have not been good stewards and shared justly. We give thanks for the freedom and power you give us to resist this injustice. By writing these letters to Congress today, we use that power in a small way so that we might answer your call to feed those who are struggling with hunger. We present these letters as a humble offering and ask your blessing upon them. Bless the readers and decision makers they reach that they may hear your call to allot our shared resources so that people who are hungry, hungry may be fed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue with our prayers of intercession, and as I said, we, can, we will collect some of those at the conclusion. Remain seated, let us pray. Longing for God's will to be fulfilled among us, we pray persistently for the church, the world, and all people in need. Holy One, open lines of communication within your church, enabling us to listen to each person's voice and lift up each person's unique gifts for your sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Fill creation from mountain peaks to the deepest valleys with your invigorating spirit. Give strength and provision to animals that prepare for colder weather. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant your spirit of humility to those who hold authority. 
direct political leaders to live in service to their citizens and turn our eyes and our hearts toward our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guard and protect the ones who call you out of despair and illness or injury. Deliver them from their struggles into havens where they can find healing and faithful companionship. We pray especially for the family of Robert, the family of Jonathan, Elaine, Jane, Carlene, Lori, Carol, Bill, Jerry, Pat, Jory, Wanda, Jason, the family of Wayne, Bud, Jean, Carol, Nikki, Susan, Reed, Annette, Yvonne, Cadence, Tim, Elsie, and those who name now silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bear the pain of people who are denied justice, especially when it results in violence or death. Bring your peaceful rule into the world for the sake of those who are oppressed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prepare a seat for all the saints in your holy realm. Bring us all into a righteous reality where honor is given to the lowly, and where we all share the life that you give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Enfold all things in your compassion, O God, and bring us into your life through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share Christ's peace with our brothers and sisters prayer for communion. Please stand as you're able. Let us pray. <clears throat> Invisible, eternal Father, you give each age their signs of grace and glory. Multiply the good effect of all we give and do for you, giving signs to increase our faith that your kingdom comes. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your, of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Speak to us, O Lord, in the breaking of the bread, and make us one with you. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
many others to receive the sacrament that we've missed. Please stand and let us pray. O oh Lord, you love to give new life through the forgiveness of sin. Complete our prayers by teaching us to live in the joy of this same love while we struggle to reach the safety of your home. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for some brief announcements. Go in peace, sound the good news. Thanks be to God.